And um, so welcome everybody. And I am here to, um, on in part, part to, oh, I apologize. <laughs> I'm, my name is Wyatt I'm with Bookworks. I'm here with the NHCC and I will present Patricia Perea, welcome. And I'll let you take over. Hakeem, welcome. Gracias. So bienvenidos a todos. It's so good to see you all tonight. Um, thank you for attending this event. And I'm looking forward to hearing these poems. I've been looking forward to it since we started promoting it about a month ago. So let me do a little bit of an intro for Hakeem, even though I'm sure, and it looks like most of you already know, it's always good to just refresh ourselves. Um, as the inaugural poet laureate of Albuquerque, New Mexico in 2012-2014, Hakeem Bellamy is a national and regional poetry slam champion and holds three consecutive collegiate poetry slam titles at the University of New Mexico. His poetry has been published in the Albuquerque Convention Center, on the outside of a library, in inner city buses, and in numerous anthologies across the globe. Bellamy was recognized as an honorable mention for the University of New Mexico Paul Bartlett Ray Peace Prize for his work as a community organizer and journalist in 2007, and was awarded the Emerging Creative Bravos Awards by Creative Albuquerque in 2013. In 2014, Bellamy was named a W.K. Kellogg Foundation Fellow and was awarded the Food Justice Residency at Santa Fe Art Institute. Bellamy has been named Best Poet in the weekly Alibi's annual Best of Burke poll. His first book, Swear, West End Press, UNM Press, won the Tilly Olson Award for Creative Writing from the Working Class Studies Association. And tonight's book, Commissions y Corridos, was recently published by University of New Mexico Press. And what we've got is a collection that rings with the same power and grace as the people he lauds within its pages, including Nikki Giovanni and Martin Luther King Jr. He celebrates Albuquerque and New Mexico, taking the good with the bad and reminds Burgueños that any day when you wake up along the Rio Grande is a good day. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hakeem. Oh, you're muted. muted. You know, let me pretend I've done this before. I start over and say, thank you, Dr. Perea. That was very kind of you to read that super long bio. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get find a better writer than me that will edit down my bio. But thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Wyatt. I mean, shout out to Bookworks. I mean, is Bookworks is an institution as far as local booksellers. I will always um I've, I've been fortunate enough to publish a few books over the years. Um, I was reminded by uh, Dr. Shell Sanchez, who, uh, who I get to work with and work under at the city of Albuquerque in my current position, that I've been fortunate to have a book come out every two years and um, since my first one in 2012. Uh, and it's ironic that at the 10 year mark, the first one was UNM Press and this one is UNM Press. Um, so that, um, that, that is, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that at my age right now. I feel fortunate, I feel lucky. Um, but, but whenever folks ask me where can, they can buy my books, I say at your local bookstore before I say Amazon and uh, Bookworks is that for our community. So I encourage you, if you're interested, if any of these poems hit you all up in the fields and you're like, I want to buy that, um, then you should go check it out. You should go buy it at Bookworks. That would be, that would be awesome. And then if you are far away, like some of my folks in New Jersey, my hometown folks who are joining us for this reading today, you can order them. I believe from Bookworks and also from UNM Press. Um, yeah, you know, buy local. So thank you for that. Uh, I wanna go back to thanking again, my boss, uh, Dr. Shell Sanchez, because it was really her vision for this whole series. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, my successor, uh, PL2, as I call her, Jessica Helen Lopez and, and her class from NACA, her poetry class from NACA on the call today. But um, Shell, when we, when we first started with the Keller administration, um, shout out to the mayor, uh, her idea was that the city should invest in publishing books for all the poets laureate. So you can expect one from Mary Oishi coming soon as she completes her term. And uh, ideally for as, as long as we get to have poets laureate in this, in this city, that each year there will be another opportunity for them to publish at the end of their term. Um, I, the title of my book even was a little bit tongue in cheek for Commissions y Corridos because um, a lot of these poems were written for events. They're occasional poems. Um, that's the job of a poet laureate is to be uh, present and to be a feeler as things are happening in real time. 
um, not necessarily so that they become historical record per se, but just so that you can reflect back to the community um, the moment. And, uh, and, and so they weren't, these poems weren't published anywhere. And I would get asked often um, because Albuquerque is really good to me when I'm out in public, they're like, hey, I saw you in 2013 and you read this poem about X, Y, Z and is it published anywhere? And I'd be like, no, it's not until now, until now. So thank you, Dr. Sanchez for um, making that a reality. And um, I'm just like a weird, um, somewhat conflict of interest that I work for the city while we are doing it. it was somewhat of a weird conflict of interest, but um, we did it the right way as we are assured that by our legal team and by our, our fiscal team. So I want to jump into a poem, enough, enough nervous ramble, but I do want to, I want to encourage you if you have the book, which I do in my hand, I'm actually going to read it from the screen, but this, this particular part is not on, this, not on my screen, um, my preface. And uh, I want to share that with you guys, because if you're, if you're kind enough to be here today, I want you to understand kind of where these poems are coming from. And then I'm, I'm going to try to run through as many of them as I can before we Q&A. Um, keep it keep it simple and stupid for Hakeem. But I want to start with the preface to give you some context. This city is more than inspiring. It's a co-author. Let me explain. Sometimes poets laureate get to write poems for fun or necessity that are not occasional poems. The poems in this collection are not all commissions, and the poems are not corridos per se. They are not eight quatrains that are four to six lines each. The lines are not octosyllabic. The rhythm is not duple meter. The music is inaudible. The corridista is black. But they are songs. They are songs about my life in this place full of characters, including Borque itself, real and make-believe, helplessly mortal and hopeful. These songs are sometimes dreams and sometimes memories, things I don't want to forget things I don't want us to forget, things I want us to become. Beyond providing a community with a sense of cultural identity and pride, a corrido offers an interpretation of certain well-known past events that should exist as common knowledge to the community. I offer this collection of poems and my time as laureate as an earnest attempt to accomplish this. That same desire is what marries the corridos in this collection to the commissions. As I mentioned, not all the poems collected here are commissions. Some were not even composed during my tenure as city laureate. That is by design partially because when one's city ordains someone with the responsibility of capturing history as it evolves in real time, in verse, you never get to put it down. However, it is also because my term was all of me. Not only did Albuquerque's decision to select me as the city's first poet laureate define me as an artist, it also, by virtue of its selection, made a profound statement that my experience as a 34-year-old Black man in America at the time was as New Mexican and different as different colored Chile, Chile, sorry, in a place where nothing is Black and white, where everything is Christmas, Albuquerque accepted my realism for magic. When I'm asked how long it takes me to write a poem, my answer is always a function of whatever age I am at the time of the poem request. At the time of this writing, I am 42 years old. Therefore, by my math, it took me 42 years to write this. It took all of me to write this, just as it took all of me to serve as poet laureate of this great city, a city that took a chance on me and put me on its shoulders and forever changed my life as a result. So as much as these poems are a thank you, they are written after my, they are all written after my induction ceremony because there is no going back, Albuquerque. We are inextricably bound from here on out and everything I write is about you. So that was my preface and I spent a lot of time on it to try to get it right uh, because that's, that's how I felt and that's how I still feel. Now 43, because uh, books take a while to publish. But um, yeah, thank you. I love you guys. I, didn't know it was gonna almost make me cry, but there you go. So let's jump into some poems and I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead off. I'm gonna do a little bit of commentary. So it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a typical uh, Hakeem fair, but um, this first poem, and I felt important for it to be the first poem in the book was actually the poem I got to write for the centennial um, for the city of Albuquerque. Um, at the time, I was not yet poet laureate when I wrote this poem, but I was asked by then Mayor Barry to present a poem at the celebration on Civic Plaza it was a highlight of my career, getting ready to go on in between Robert Mirabal and Los Lobos. 
and it was packed. Um, I, I was not able to make it to the Holly Home Parade um, or the Women's March the first year, but I imagine it was kind of like that. And, um, and I struggled with this poem because I didn't feel like I was the person who should be writing it. It's the same insecurities I had about being the first poet laureate and, and not being from here. Uh, but um, I had some good mentors that coached me along. In this case, it was Levi Romero, um, who was our first state poet laureate. And he was like, man, just like, write, write, don't try to write the poem as a New Mexican, write the poem as some young black kid from Philly who came out here and fell in love. And uh, the people who really get this will appreciate your love poem. And he also introduced me, gave me some things to go read because that's Levi, he's a, he's, a, he's a Yoda of sorts, a Jedi trainer. And uh, he sent me home with a stack of books. Um, and, uh, and I went home and the one that drew me most was the one that was a book of, of corridos. And I was like, dang, a historical song. That's awesome because I like history and I like songs. And so uh, I wrote this uh, for that. And I felt like it was cool to read because it was kind of like a precursor to my term as laureate. It's called 100 Years of Corridos, a song for the New Mexico Centennial. In the first chapter of the Gospel to Anaya, Rudolfo writes, all of the older people spoke only Spanish, and I myself understood only Spanish in English. Bienvenidos, Albuquerque. I myself understand only English in Diné. We speak many languages, but mean the same thing, and mañana will mean more of the same. Familia, food, fiesta, forever. Come on and sing along. We're going to familia, comida, fiesta, forever. For 100 years BC, before the Commodores, before Lionel Richie, and for 100 years more, we've farmed, feasted, and fixed cars. We've moved people and mixed razas. We've got an appointment with the curandera as soon as we leave the doctors. A lust for livestock like chupacabras, afraid of God and the inexplicable dinosaur fossils, so in love with space and the people who live there that we speak Chewbacca. <laughs> The 47th state admitted to the union, we might as well have been the moon of Endor to our forefathers with the oldest and highest state capital in the country. People on both coasts should look up to us instead of wondering if they have to exchange their money before coming. Yes, dollars is our official currency too. And though we don't have much of it, money can't buy cultura. Our history book, the King Alfonso version is a canon of wars and peace a Bible of you and me that was written in Madrid by missionaries and mestizos. We are men of magic and women of wizardry who speak in spell and song, wing words and fly them like a flag, all yellow between red and green like a traffic light, like the state question is hurry up or slow down, never stop. All of the older people sung only corridos. However, in those corridos, me, I only heard gospel. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's a stage. But every time I hear the clap of thunder, it sounds like a blessing. Every time I hear the pitter patter of rain, it sounds like a round of applause. And even the monsoon roars encore as the flash bloods flood our hearts with love. After 100 New Year's Eves of trying to puncture precipitation where the sky never dies and the clouds wear bulletproof vests, where we perpetually live in the shadow of a hot air balloon eclipse, we are not a city that speaks good morning. We are a city that speaks mass ascension, like grandpa only spoke Spanish when he was drinking buenos dias, like grandma only spoke Latin when she was praying buenas noches, where water is so sacred and scarce that we pot it in puddles on our flat roofs, pool it in vestibuled stoops of steeple temples where pigeons squirrel and roost, pond it in mountaintops on our not so flat horizons where we bottle it in our bodies and then set fire to it in our forest where it sounds like a Sikia's babble, amen. And bosques smell like baptisms where the rain doesn't speak any language. It only understands dance and sometimes we miss it so much. We need two rainbows to promise us it is coming back. After thousands of years of owners for this 
little piece of hacienda. It's been us as tenants together, roommates for the past hundred. Call it a trust. Call it a Zia-shaped symbol for eternity over our right ring finger. Call it the interconnectedness of cultures. Call it married to each other. Speak now or forever hold your cheese, man. We are actions speak louder than wordsmiths, storytelling rituals where we don't speak project runway, we cowboy cosmopolitan, urban traditional where our children dare not say or see kakui or laerona, but our lucky Santa speaks Spanglish and has a sweet tooth for leche y bizcochitos where birthdays are miracles and each one has a spirit, holy spirit or patron saint where we celebrate 100 today in the beginning the greatest spirit created America and the earth. And it was bueno. I don't speak perfect English, barely speak passable Spanish, but it's okay because there's no such thing as perfect English except for the word Nuevo Mexico. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the Centennial poem. And uh, you guys might get a better one in another hundred years, but that's the one you got. Um, so uh, yeah, I wanted to share that one first and that's why I put it, put it first in the book, hopefully a hundred years from now that things, things have evolved, including the poets and their poetry. Next is, uh, I had a chance, I had a chance, which is a little bit full circle. I've been, I wanted to tell this story. I don't know if um, my, my folks who are now my team and, and, my, and my staff at uh, the Department of Arts and Culture at the city of Albuquerque, but uh, a lot of people took a chance on me. Um, early on as an out-of-towner. And we know how New Mexicans feel about out-of-towners. So a lot of people took a chance on me. And uh, one of the folks that did that was uh, prior to my time being the poet laureate was um, the Albuquerque Museum, which is actually in my department now. And they had me come do uh, a residency there in the Common Ground exhibit, which is getting a remodel right now, in case you're interested or just finished a remodel. But um, at the time, it was like my dream job, like to live in a museum, like some night at the museum stuff where you just come out at night and walk amongst the paintings and then during the day because poets are notoriously afraid of people except for when they're on stage and they're so during the day you're up in the attic just writing poems about the artwork like ekphrastic poetry both ways being inspired by the, the artwork and hopefully the artists being inspired by, by the people who are writing about it um, and I was allowed to to spend a lot of time in the exhibit and reflect on some of the pieces. And there's one poem, uh, poem, excuse me, piece of painting. Some of you who've been to the Albuquerque Museum might know it. Um, it. It's moved since then, it moves around the gallery, but it continues to be on display and it shows the horizon. And it's like blood orange red. And there's like this yucca or, or spine cactus that's obstructing your view as you look at the horizon and it's like blood orange and blue. And from that picture, that painting, I wrote this haiku. It's called New Mexico Department of Tourism, a haiku. Title's already longer than a haiku. If you know what a haiku is, if you know, you know, okay. Albuquerque, where the desert doesn't get in the way of your view. Thank you. I feel like a bad magician, but that's, that's what that, 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 that painting inspired me to write. Um, the next piece in the book is actually a function of a poem that I wrote prior to my time as laureate. Um, some of you are familiar with the Burnley County Place Matters Group. I did a lot of work with them um, in my various positions in nonprofits and throughout the community. Um, was super fond of what they were trying to do in our community. And then um, there was a National Place Matters Conference. And uh, like much like you would pitch a, a, a workshop proposal at a conference, um, this was in DC, uh, then they pitched this guy that lives here in Albuquerque wrote this poem about Place Matters, and that's the name of the national organization. You should have them come read the poem at your conference as a keynote. And they said yes. And uh, when I read, I went the weekend I went home to read that poem in, 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 uh, in DC, my mom's mother passed away, my grandmother. And I was struck with the choice of going to my grandmother's funeral, who was very much part of my life and going to this national conference, probably the first thing outside of New Mexico that I was, I was being invited to. And um, my mom told me, your grandma will want you to be there. And so I went there and I went home immediately after. And um, me and my mom sat on the porch, or on, on, I mean, in the living room and watched like a Harry Potter marathon because that's how she was grieving. And I was just there to support her. 
But um, fast forward a few years later, because of that performance and appearance, I got hooked up with SAMHSA. Some of you guys know the mental health group, the National Mental Health Organization, SAMHSA. And uh, they invited me later to another uh, conference during my term uh, called Health Affairs. And this was the poem I wrote for them. It was a commission and it was called Fisher Price School of Medicine. <clears throat> One, the last time I went to the doctor, I was 11. She wore more pigtails than lab coat. Her only qualifications was a plastic stethoscope. The glasses she wore had no lenses, not exactly an optometrist, but her IQ was no stretch of the imagination. She could see exactly what was wrong with me after just a handful of questions, diet, lifestyle, heartbreak, heartbreak, heart. She was elevator music. I was slightly high blood pressure, otherwise the picture of health. She somehow knew that a smile was the best kind of medicine, so she gave me hers. As I left, I took mine too and called her in the morning. Two. The next time I go to the doctors, I will have some questions for her. I will ask her why every day I get out of bed and feel less and less 11, why my joints never ached in bad weather, but hollow every night at 5.30 and 6 p.m. when the weatherman brings bad news. I'll ask her if life is a death sentence, if living is a terminal disease. Sometimes this ride begins and ends in an emergency room, but it really starts and stops in between. I'll ask her what happened to house visits. Tell her all about how I've been sleeping, over a cup of tea because the six minute average doctor patient interaction is not enough to treat me. I will unpack my recurring nightmares before her like a roadmap to my anxiety, take a handful of those pretty little purple pills that I refuse to let her prescribe me and connect the dots back to my historical trauma. I will explain to her why every time I push and twist the top off them drugstore bottles, it smells like cotton that it is not her job to childproof me from my past, that there aren't enough milligrams in that script to rewrite it or fix it. Her job ain't even to help me live with it. Her job is to help me outlive it. Then I will pour her another cup because I am not done. I will ask her to explain me the difference between health care and who cares. I will ask her what it will take to incentivize death prevention. I will suggest that if the measure of a health professional is how many lives they save, why wait till we roll out the examination room sideways when it should profit her to protect us while we are still up? Will we wait until more black boys die at the hand of the police than diabetes to consider violence an institutional health issue? Will we wait until our children put two and two together, do the math and the science, the English and the social studies, only to remind us every few months or so that broken school plus broken homes means the game is fixed? Will we wait till Mother Nature is in hospice, her immune system thin as ozone, her polar caps bald as chemo to reconsider what World Health Organization ought to mean? When will we start saving lives outside? And she will be waiting for me to finally stop asking questions. And I will tell her we've been waiting to death like patients when we are wanting to be fed like pupils with the potential to bloom. The next time I see her, I will tell her there's no need to wash her hands. The dirtier, the better. Leave your sleeves rolled up. We need more than a surgeon general. We need a pediatric infantry, a front line of physicians slinging arms into armistices instead of armor and stitches because I'm no PhD but it stands to reason that war is pretty much the most unhealthy thing we do to ourselves next to not brushing our teeth. It's more than a cavity in the ground. It's a cavity of the soul. And I know what she'll say, damn it, Jim, I'm not a pastor. However, unlike a priest, you aren't just there at dusk to hold hands, close eyelids and console us. You are there at dawn, the first sight for sore eyes. And if we are lucky, even a smack on the behind to comfort us. And I just wish I saw you a few more Sundays in between because there's so much healing to do. And I don't, wait, I don't wanna wait till I'm hurt to see a doctor. Three, the last time I'll ever go to see a doctor, I will ask her what took her so long. I wonder after this many years and that many smarts, how in heaven she hasn't found a vaccine for broken hearts or a way to add padding to the walls of my father's brain so his memories can't escape. I'll tell her my worst dreams of high school cafeterias with semi-automatic handguns and vending machines. I'll suggest that there is no such thing as a mental health day in a world so chemically imbalanced, biological warfare is in our bloodstream. It's more like a staycation in a hospital or a holding cell. 
incarcerated in our membranes and retail therapy is a grossly inadequate cure. I'll ask her if I'll live and she won't make any promises or percentages. She won't even order an X-ray or an MRI because she's got the same magic glassless glasses she had since she was nine. She already knows what's inside. Her laugh will have the same effect it did on my blood pressure when I was 11. She'll tell me I'm not crazy, just a hypochondriac that we're all dying daily and some of us are just waiting better or worse, slower and faster than others. She'll give me a smile and tell me it's contagious and send me back out into this ecosystem of people smoking on treadmills and jogging into the smog. But at least she'll call and practice the forgotten art of checking on me tomorrow. And when I ask her again if I'll live, she'll tell me the truth. She'll say no, but you'll be okay. So yeah, that was for, uh, that was for the Narrative Matters conference. And I forgot how much I like that poem. Old poems don't get read much. It's, it's sad, but uh, when you get an opportunity like this to bring those poems, to resurrect those poems, no pun intended, it was a medical, allegory uh that it's nice because then you're like dude i wasn't as bad a writer as i thought i was i also wasn't as good a writer as i thought i was but it's, it's all good they're published so they're real now the next poem is uh, a little bit more straightforward so no long no long preamble it is a uh, a response to some of us remember when the when uh and rest in peace rudy and Aya, we remember when they made a movie of his book and actually the National Hispanic Cultural Center, who's a partner on this reading, uh, did a film, a filming, a screening of it, uh, I think prior to its theatrical release in theaters, and I was able to go. Um, I've actually never met, I never met Mr. and I, I was fortunate to be in, in his orbit uh, later in life as his health declined, um, and almost got to interview him for a Colores, which Jess Cullen Lopez also hosted too, or still hosts, um, but, um, but his health was not great for him to be there. Uh, but it was great to love his book and learn his book. I didn't go to high school here, so it wasn't compulsory for me. I came here as an adult and read it on my own, which is nice to read books that you're not told to read. And then, um, and then when the movie came out, uh, I had I had all kind of feelings about it, and so I I wrote this poem um, based on the book and the movie. And I just I just hopped out of my my PDF. Bear with me a second here. There we go. It's called Bless Me, inspired by the life and literature of Rudy Anaya. No, Antonio, you are not broken. You will fix us in the places that miracles have failed and forgotten. Eastern New Mexico has been fighting long before World War II, and it's quite normal for war to make people lose their faith in everything. But you are fact. And where you are from is fertile. Here, they harvest soldiers and priests for lunch, but you are cosmic, a constellation of culture that could tie up the entire, that could tip the entire Yano towards the sun, just to get her attention, to remind her that we are her children dying to get closer to her by bullet or belief. And you, Antonio, will concern yourself with the fate of every soul while the church concerns itself with the fate of every pocket. Guadalupe is more than your home, Antonio. It's where your heart is buried, beneath the beaten, beneath the beatings, beneath your classmates mocking you. Bless me, Antonio, beneath the beating earth pumping mud through our veins. I may be no virgin, but as sure as Juan Diego smelled the rose petals on Our Lady's breath, I will give you this Nawa, this language of healing and curanderismo in hopes that you one day find yourself, Antonio. And when you do, perhaps you will find your God curled up behind you Protect him, speak to him in the tongue of the land I taught you and then tell him to pick up a shovel and saddle up because there are too many miracles and not enough time because this is the army the priest should have prayed for, the army the soldier should have joined because we need all the help we can get. So yes, that's for Rudy. And obviously I'm trying to, you know, put myself in, um, in, in, in Ultima shoes I like to, uh, yeah, I like to, uh, I like to cross dress in my writing. That's just what I like to do. I like to put myself in, uh, in other people's minds and bodies. And so to play, to even to pretend to write a poem as Ultima is like my favorite kind of drag. So um, that was that, that was that poem. 
the next piece, and uh, I'm keeping an eye on the chat because I feel like somebody should tell me when we're running out of time. Uh, we're at 6.35, but, uh, and I won't get through the whole manuscript, but I feel like, you know, it's a good teaser. I've toyed with all kind of, should I read this poem first? Should I read that poem? I know the two last poems I want to read. And so I just feel like a 10 minute heads up, right? So shout out to Dr. Perea and why it hooked me up. Um, and then, um, but the next poem is actually a poem that I was lucky enough to have published in World Poetry Today, um, which was huge as a big, uh, you know, for poets, we have our own kind of career bucket list of things we'd like to do. And um, that was one. Another one was when I had that Health Matters, that Narrative Matters poem, the, the Fisher Price School of Medicine poem. While I was there and uh, my mom was burying my grandmother, I had the opportunity to also perform at Bus Boys and Poets. And so if you've ever been to DC, you know, Bus Boys and Poets is a, is a, a local chain of restaurant and awesome poetry readings named after um, Langston Hughes, who was both a busboy and a poet. And so to read there, I read there that weekend as well, which was kind of a, a bucket list thing. But getting published in World Poetry Today was bucket list thing, or World Literature Today. And um, this was the poem that they published. And it was written for um, one of our uh, International Day of Workers and for Labor Day. And it was a labor movement poem um, that was actually commissioned by the, the local labor union, the statewide labor union here. So I felt um, it felt like an anthem poem. A lot of how I made my bones as a poet prior to becoming a laureate was uh, I was a journalist at KUNM when I first moved here. Got a crash course in kind of New Mexico politics, things that don't occur to a guy from New Jersey, like water law. Uh, and, and immediately I would started sticking my microphone in people's face to edit audio stories for the radio. Um, and then um, they started sticking microphones in my face and I got to be, um, Welcome at a lot of rallies. You can see in my themes of war, and labor, and love, and color, and, 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 and love. And so, like, this was one of those um, rally poems, which are, you know, a, a form of spoken word poetry. Like, there's like slam poems and there's like rally poems. Like, you're going to the rally. What do you need to write for the rally? And uh, this was the one I wrote. So, it's called Bread and Roses, and it comes with a little bit of a preamble. In the year of our constitution, 1787, our country was already over 150 years into the practice of creating free and cheap laborers for life. And in 1786, printers in our then capital of Philadelphia, my hometown, conducted the first successful strike for increased wages. Over a hundred years later in 1902, a former dressmaker and school teacher known simply as Mother Jones will be called, quote, the most dangerous woman in America. And over a hundred years to now, we still have a long way to go in a country that democratically elects leaders who genuinely believe that underpaid teachers and their unions are the biggest threat to our future. Uh, that was written long before Donald Trump too. Anyway, bread and, pro bread and roses after Helen Todd and James Oppenheim. The very first unions in America were brought here by boat, broken by back, by whip, rape and rope. Nowadays, lies in a boogeyman economy do the trick. The only thing scarier than labor is losing it. Even the House and Senate can come together around house and field, divide and conquer, give us power but not position, give us personnel but not privilege, give us responsibility but not rights, nor profits, nor shares. Give us, give us a sniff of American exceptionalism, get us drunk off of upward mobility, put us behind the wheel of the American dream until we launch ourselves into a windshield that will not let us eject or escape this cabin. I come from a long line of laborers, a lineage of long black men who nowadays only unionize for sport, who are either rich enough to be locked out or poor enough to be locked in, but back then were Memphis enough to get Dr. King to detour towards death in the name of fairness. Air Jordan-esque working conditions, laceless wages, boots that were begging for straps. We are colonial Philadelphia, 1806ers, journeymen convicted of criminal conspiracy. We are New York, 1829, working men's party when 60 hours a six day work week was radical. Every morning we wake up nights of labor to whistles of work and whispers of worse. Integrated women into our own Negro spirituals of sorts hold the forts at a time when mining companies would send dynamite husbands home in a bucket and mothers like Jones who lived in homes rented from the employer fed family with currency only good at the company store. 
We had three days to replace Papa with one of her sons so production doesn't suffer. No matter how young we was, no matter how much she does, we are immigrants. Molly's 1877 pushed too far. We are the children worked too hard. The reason Mary Harris marched from the city of brotherly love to Teddy Roosevelt's front porch, we found our own Congress of industrial organizations to, to replace the one that had forsaken us. We are sit down strikes in the buildings they value with our bodies that they do not. We are wage equity and wage war. We are ripped off scabs that will not bandage their cuts after we strike, only band together our blood and heal. We are still leaping from ninth floor windows at the Triangle Waste Company. We are Clara Lemlick, we are Dolores Huerta, we are Cesar Chavez, we are Samuel Gompers, we are Gabriel Prosser, we are Lucy Gonzalez Parsons, and we are Rosie the Riveter. We are the hand on the Bible, denying we are socialists. We are the witches of Taft Hartley. We are holy, Jerry Falwell, salt of the earth, who forever put love of God before love of greed. You said, Labor unions should study and read the Bible instead of asking for more money. But we are reapers, pickers who reap and sow and read. Sirach 3422, to take away a neighbor's living is to murder him. To deprive an employee his wage is to shed blood. We're teamsters and longshoremen, and just like you, we ain't perfect. Proverbs 1431, he who oppresses a poor man insults his maker. We are closed factories and empty mouths, auto textiles and steel. We are the meek who inherit ourselves. We are the lamb, the sacrifice, and the carpenter that said, the worker deserves his wages. Luke 10, 7. We are the people who power dreams and profit and are for granted and are forgotten. We are the people who brought you the weekend, who aren't coming home empty handed. We are back pockets of college tuition. We are stuffed between the mattresses of future Christmases. We are smiles on our children's faces. And even though we are sometimes faceless, we are food in the fridge. We are hero and heroine. We are coming back, coming home every night in one piece. Please, please believe that we are all hard work and belief. We are about 5.05, 5.30, 6.15. We are bread and roses for dinner. Yeah, so there's that poem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much love in the chat. Thank you very much. Appreciate y'all listening so hard. If I was still teaching my class at UNM, you would get A's. You'd get bonus points. The class, the class that, that just, well, Jessica's teaching at NACA. Levi has a class that we, many of us taught. Carlos taught it. Jessica taught it. I want to say Manny maybe taught it was to writers in the community. Um, yeah, like it's super dope. And we're trying to figure out how to get interns from that class for the city. Levi, we're working on it. You can hear me. We're working on it. So a fun poem, because you know, rally, protest, political poets, so serious, right? Everything's so sad. Everything's like race, race, race. Um, so uh, sometimes I get to write fun poems and one of the funner, more fun poems I got to write during my time as laureate. Um, and the fun poems matter because, you know, there's some spaces. Maybe Jessica will talk about this tomorrow at her reading because uh, PL1 and PL2's books both came out at the same time. Sometimes uh, as, as a poet laureate, you are in spaces where you have to try to speak to the experience of all the people. And we know that there is no one experience for all the people, they're very different. And then sometimes you just have to go in spaces and like, you know, share a poem that, that no one will be um, upset over. And we all navigate that differently, um, hopefully with our integrity of our creative freedom. But um, sometimes we just get to write poems for fun. And, and this is one of the poems that became a popular poem that people wanted to hear more often. It was never published anywhere. It's about New Mexican food. So if you can't get behind that, I don't know what your politics are, uh, but um, this is a poem, it's called uh, Blue Corn Special. There is butter in the barrio that will not let us slide or slip in La Cocina. We will take a kitchen to our worries like sugar cane, weed people out of our lives like weeds, put, back, put butt on back, meat on bone, and two skinny nephews like butter. Put family in marrow like osobuco, put family in marrow like leftovers. There is butter in the barrio that will not let us lose weight, that keeps us afflicted with healthy 
heavy heart disease, like we got a crush on ourselves because our capacity for love is bigger than our waistlines because we will fit a feast day and a pheasant in the center of a circle of friends like an open mouth waiting for rain. We wear our dinner like blackberry rouge, a swollen jaw full of seconds always coming back for more. Home cooked and half baked, we eat hella good. Even when hell is bad, we stand in the heat. We live in the kitchen, comfort food, until we're uncomfortable. We smile huge with our hips from cheek to cheek, stuffing I don't care in our right pocket and stuffing I don't cholesterol in our left. We are a buffalo buffet, no bull. There is butter in the barrio that will not let us burn, just brown, fly like tortilla, never drown, not even at the cantina, as sure as fried bread floats. Cheap charity with chicharrones, cash poor but abundant in familia, a surplus of sisters and a myriad of dishes we can whip up from corn, bean, and squash. We put the carne in carnal, flesh of my flesh, blood of my tofu. We are as green as the farmer and as red as his boots. We sound like my uncle when I was young and chunky and he said I was on a seafood diet because when you don't know when your next meal is coming, you eat all the food you see. We sound like my father when his son left for college, a carnivore and came back only eating leaves. And he said, son, tummy doesn't grow on trees. We sound like a good conversation, the perfect pair to every meal like laughter and it doesn't matter white or red. We put our values where our mouth is like we are vegans. We are all eyes bigger than our stomach that go down swinging by mortar and pestle. We make masa of the mesa as it rolls itself thin as the horizon is yellow toward the blue corn sky. There is butter in the barrio that should have killed us by now. But in the belly of the beast, you gotta try harder than that. We will feed a multitude with five bushels of red and two fish. As long as you don't ask where the fish comes from. When life gave us limes, we made tequila, made a mean lime butter sauce that really brings a dish together like people. We are like butter, baby. We are the butter in the barrio that has fueled warriors and fertilized wombs, slathered blankets of our hands over beds of flour and yielded a sea of sopapilla. We are whom we eat as we snap, crackle, dance, and sing in this comal of a desert that gives us life one meal at a time. So that's me um, really loving my food out here. Um, really, I mean, a kid from Jersey been out here. It'll be, my son's 13. Gosh, it'll be 17 years, I think, on MLK Day. I'm also that weird black guy that arrived here on MLK Day, because somehow I thought that would be cute. But um, that, yeah, that's why I've been here so long. The people, yes. The weather, yes. The food, most certainly, most certainly. Um, and so the, I, I feel like I have 10 minutes, so we're getting there. Thank you, Wyatt, for that. Um, I feel like that will give me, if I'm gonna do the last two poems, I should do them now. Um, and I wanted to end with those because, you know, part of um, what allowed us to do this, and just a little bit of a oral history here, no pun intended, is that um, when I was invited to the Poet Laureate ship in 2012. It was mostly a, a community-led effort that the city sanctioned, and but it did not resource. Um, all the resource came from the McCune Charitable Foundation, shout out to McCune, and um, the folks that were the committee. If you get to read the book, you will see um, Dr. Sanchez's uh, preface that talks really about the process of how the Poet Laureate becomes the Poet Laureate. We were intentional at the time about making sure there was a a way for it not just to be the friend of an elected. And so we have a community committee that kind of manages the nonprofit work of the Poet Laureate um, over the course of their tenure. And then we, and they actually build a selection committee that convenes like a jury every two years to actually make the decision. And um, there's a lot of intention around one person coming from the publishing world, one come, person coming from like the nonprofit community activist world, um, other, another poet who's in a community who is not put their candidacy forth as on the committee. There's always a young person on that committee because part of what makes the Poet Laureate job you know, auspicious is the work we get to do in schools and really um, sharing our love for the word and hopefully inspire future poets um, like Naka's doing today. And so um, it's really intentional that that seven person committee comes together and they choose the person based on a consensus model. So there is no leaving unless they're all in agreement and, and can defend the choice. 
But when we first started, it was an experiment. I did my two years and then um, thankful to uh, people who were on the committee at that time, uh, namely Julia Mandeville and uh, Dr. Michelle Sanchez, Mindy Grossberg, Don McIver, I'm trying to think of everyone, Susan McAllister, that whole team. Um, we went to Mayor Barry, thanks, shout out to Mayor Barry, thank you for this, and asked him for um, some resource. And at the time he gave us $10,000 in the city budget for a two year term, so roughly $5,000 a year to do programming. So the stipend for the poet is still, I think it's still two Gs, you have to ask Mary, <laughs> but uh, that's what they get to pocket. But the rest is to right, do programs and really to bring poetry as, as is the charge of a poet laureate to bring poetry to places it's not normally found. And that can be a school that doesn't have the money and now you have a budget to do that or to do like incredible programming like Jessica, Manny, Michelle Otero and, um, and Mary Oishi did through their term, you have to have a budget to, to, to do those things. And so we're excited about that. We're glad this mayor, uh, who is also an art lover, continued it um, and, um, and, and shout out to both mayors for finding that it's something valuable for our city. As you know, when Levi was named State Poet Laureate, we were one of only three states left that didn't have a state laureate, but at least, um, you know, Santa Fe, I know, I uh, think Silver City, Taos, Albuquerque, we were trying to do it to try to push things along so that it would happen. Um, and so I was asked during that tenure to write a poem as Mayor Barry was going out of office. Um, and it's really a personal poem for my relationship with him. Um, people who know me and know him know we don't necessarily same, share the same politics, but he's the one who brought me into city government after my term was up. And uh, we found lots of common ground around the work we wanted to do for our young people. And that, that, those were the grants I worked on my few years in his administration where the AmeriCorps grant for student success, putting 40 AmeriCorps members in 12 Title I schools, and then working on some creative economy work with the Bloomberg Foundation that Dr. Sanchez and I and Brandon Gibson, our other deputy, are actually getting to make good on. So a report that uh, I thought was going nowhere gets to go somewhere. And that's just the luck of being in this seat at this, at this current time. So all good things, but I feel like both of those mayors should get the goodbyes because uh, that's kind of how we got here. One, the mayor, one mayor gave, gave money to the program, the other mayor picked Shell to lead the department. So mayor for Richard J. Berry, followed by CDO on the inauguration of Tim Keller. Oh, why, am I, why am I reading the book when I have it on my screen? Technology. What you didn't get, and this is how I'm gonna tease the book, is the next poem you're gonna hear in sequence was the poem I got invited to write. Um, shout out to Amanda Sutton again. I got out to write it when Nikki Giovanni visited and, and got to meet one of my literary heroes and be on stage with her and read her a poem about her. And um, that poem's in the book. And uh, she subsequently went on the Tavis Smiley show and he asked her what poets people be looking out for up and coming. And she said me, uh, which was crazy. I still don't believe it. But if you wanna read that poem, you gotta buy the book. Mayor for Richard J. Berry. It's premature to call the race a race. Let me stop, start over. You know RJ, you know he was a track guy. That was another thing we bonded over. Um, so here you go, Mayor for Richard J. Berry. It's premature to call the race a race when in fact the election is just the beginning. After all the stripes, lanes, names, and numbers, you are left both podium and custodian with expectations that you run again, that the times go down even as your age inches up, that you fasten your accomplishments and do more and less, all while tending to the track, making sure both the idling and the passing lanes are open to fast and slow alike. Being mayor is like going from the Olympics to parks and rec. And it's funny that there's no way to practice for this competition only on the job training and exercise and endurance, both long haul and quick study because it is more than being fit to serve, it is live and learn. It is finishing what you started in every stride in between from the farmer's market to the press conferences, the panda bear christenings and the fallen officers. There is a pedometer in your pocket that serves as evidence of the time you spent on your feet for your team, Albuquerque. And as you ride off into the stands, sunset in hand, you suddenly realize the resemblance between a diploma and a baton. That's why students make the best coaches, pass it on. Because long before we raise any banners of our, our job is to take care of our bodies 
And at this municipal track meet, everybody means the well being of our entire team. Belonging to each other is the real race because we never run alone, we just take turns. There's a marathon in every lesson, but the hurdles are free. So that was, uh, that was for a mayor. And this one is for another mayor. Oh, thanks for that comment, Patricia. I've actually been invited back to the commission um, of a national service to, uh, to share that poem that I wrote for them that I believe is in the book. Let's just look at the table of contents real fast. Did I? No, I don't think that poem's in the book. But anyway, they've asked me for a video of it, which I sent them because we recorded a video of it at the time that they're gonna use at this year's celebration because uh, AmeriCorps is an amazing program. It's the closest thing we have to a civilian corps. Um, and if there is ever gonna be compulsory service, military or otherwise, AmeriCorps is the closest thing we have to doing with, without a weapon. So shout out to AmeriCorps. Last poem, City Oak, on the inauguration of Mayor Tim Keller. Quote, may have heard this quote before. If more politicians knew poetry, and more poets knew politics, I'm convinced the world will be a little better place in which to live. John F. Kennedy. What if we elected one another instead of someone somewhere else? And I mean each other, elect to belong to something that is bigger than what sets us apart. What if we elected to belong to all our problems and all the solutions, the problems we may or may not have started, the ones we pretend to have nothing to do with, I was talking about ART there, just for the, for the cheap sheets. What if we woke up every morning being choosy? What if the only thing we abandoned was entrapment rather than our duties? Because I, for one, have had a love plate relationship with this town. And between these four walls and my relationship counselor, I learned that if I treat every single morning I awake this side of the Rio Grande as though Albuquerque's choosing me and vice versa, it's easier to find common ground somewhere between the valley and the heights to see what's working to dream bigger than what isn't, to do better than if it ain't broke, don't fix it, because good government is sort of like running a business, the business of bringing the impossible into existence, the things we cannot do alone together, like moving the private sector towards public interest because the public is wholly made up of private citizens, like people before party and politics, sort of like the golden rule long before organized religion, because even the Bible says, that church is just a building and the real temple is found within the people in it. And government is similar. Wherever two or more are gathered on a mission, underneath these double rainbows serves as a covenant between community members because a city where everyone is afraid of each other can't be good for our children, much less tourism. So every four years or so, we treat ourselves to an intervention to assess whether we are still addicted to our problems. We roll out a parade of ideas and good intentions and call it an election. Recommit to the oneness of one another till we part for the polls again. Pledge city over self reminded that this city is just a ristra of cells bound by tierra and time and a place of shared responsibility where regardless of who we did or didn't vote for, we are all mayor should we choose to accept it pledging anything we want, especially if it's wanting to wake up here. So that's what I got. That's what I got for tonight. Y'all spent an hour with me and I appreciate you. Um, it's nice to go through a down the memory lane of poems. <laughs> I, hope they, I hope they stand up to the test of time. We'll see you in 10 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. If everybody wants to, feel free to unmute yourself to give some shout outs and some applause. Wonderful. Thank nice you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Saludos. Yay, Hakeem. Uh -huh. Otra vez. <laughs> um, does anybody, we have a few minutes. Does anybody want to put some comments out or say some comments, anything? Just so very proud of our deputy director for cultural affairs and his continued work with our uh, community and how much he gives back to our community in so many ways. Thank you, Hakeem. I need, I got lots of partners in this work. Patricia's one of them. Thank you. No, 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 no. 
to say gracias. Gracias. Usted. <laughs> Except the compliment, Hakim. <laughs> we knew him when. We knew him when. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of kicks in the rears along the way. Like I feel like everybody's got a, a broke foot or a steel boot. But uh, <laughs> got me here. <laughs> slippers, Hakeem. Slippers. <laughs> <laughs> so any very the, proud of you. Any of the East Coasters want to say anything? I know it's late for all y'all. Nothing. Okay. Come on, East Coast, step on up. <laughs> Senator Feldman. Hey, Hawk, it's B. Um, man, <laughs> great job, brother. You know, you just, you constantly just make us proud. And um, yeah, yeah, I love you. And, you love know, you just too. keep doing what you're doing, man. I love you, Thank too. You. Ryan's seen me, uh, he's seen me home my chops uh, at like family weddings that he's been a part of along with me. And uh, early on in my career, I was like the, 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 the nephew or grandkid that would read at weddings and funerals, which, you know, that's a hard crucible. That's baptism. By <laughs> a, lot of that, a lot of that prepared me for the job. <laughs> like, <laughs> awesome. I love that. Anybody else? One of the things I noticed this whole time is people quoting things back at you. That's pretty awesome. It's cool to see which lines hit where. There were so many good lines and just mm -hmm. great poems, but so many good lines in there. I just, I kept being like, oh, let me grab that one. Wait, here comes another. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> so great. Hopefully they get more dense. Shout out to Liza. Liza is my son's godmother, but, but mm -hmm. she also happens to be a, a fabulous poet <laughs> in her own right, yeah. in her own right, so. Fabulous. All right. Now, never... now, mind you, my son could be here because they go to school online for the most part. He'd rather play video games. Just, just so you guys know. <laughs> just so everybody knows. This is 13. <laughs> like, just give him about 20 years. He'll be, yeah, yeah. he'll be sitting there to read. No problem. And all of this done during his part-time efforts after his deputy director position in cultural affairs, okay? Midnight to when, Hakeem? Uh, midnight to midnight. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, before we go, I just want to make sure, because I know it was in the chat a little bit, but um, please don't forget to attend Jessica Helen Lopez's book reading. That'll be October 24th, which is a Sunday at three o'clock. And that's her new collection, which I actually have in my bag, but I don't want to leave the screen for a second, but it's her new collection called The Blood Poems. So that will be out. Um, well, it's out now, but we'll be doing the reading for Bookworks and NHCC on October 24th. And then um, one other one is September 9th, uh, which is a Wednesday. I mean, no, it's a Thursday. September 9th is a Thursday. We're having a really interesting reading with Zoraida Cordova. Um, she does young adult sci-fi sci and like fantasy. So she has this whole collection of stuff on brujas in the East Coast. And I really want people to come see her new book. It's called The Inheritance of Orquidea Divina. So if you have time, you should stop by for that as well. So thank you everybody for coming. We appreciate it. Um, and go enjoy this beautiful sunset because it's gorgeous outside right now. Thank you, Hakeem. Congratulations. Thank you, Hakeem. Bye. Thank you.